if you've heard the, the rumor that I'm on a motorcycle again, I am. It's been 30 years, but I'm back on a, a big bike, big Harley Davidson classic and uh, very, very excited about that in my life. Uh, now I'm so addicted to Harley Davidson's. If I see other bikes, I knock them down. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit rough out there now because I'm on a hard. Is it loud? Oh, man, it is so loud. I call it the neighbor hater. <laughs> And uh, all my neighbors know, uh, and everyone's been asking me, does Bonnie ride with me? And yes, she does. Yes, she does. Uh, Biker terminology, she's my fender bunny. (laughs) She just loves it when I say that, by the way. We're going to talk about courage today, and uh, we're talking about uh, the awakening that started for us on Easter Sunday, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. But I've noticed something about people who ride with me. Um, As long as the road is smooth, as long as the road is is, is slow, as long as there's not a big lean or any sharp curves, I've noticed the person behind me is is really relaxed. They're watching the world go by uh, from the seat of Harley Davidson, and it's just everything is fine. But the minute there's a bump, the minute there's a a hard lean or a tight curve, I've noticed that they immediately grab on tighter. And, And let me tell you something, that has really captured uh, my spiritual journey with God. Most of the time, most of the time, I go through life on my journey pretty relaxed. Uh, I I, I believe in God. I'm connected to Jesus Christ. I, I live a pretty relaxed Christian walk. But every so often, even in my life, something will come at me, a bump, a uh, a curve that I wasn't expecting. And all of a sudden, I find myself running and clinging and holding on a little bit tighter. That does not mean that I've lost my courage. That's not what it means. It just means that there are moments in our life when we recognize that we need to hang on a little bit tighter to him today. And some of you, some of you today are in one of those situations where you're trying to hang on a little tighter. So, we did this series. It started, you know, I was going into Easter season and I realized, man, I have preached every passage about the resurrection of Jesus. I have done themes where I've given out all the evidence, all the proof of his resurrection. I mean, I've been here 16 years and we've covered a lot of territory when it comes to Jesus being alive after he was dead. So I, I was just looking for something fresh and new and I was asking myself, if I really believe the resurrection is true, if I really believe it, what does it mean to me? And immediately, immediately, there were four areas that I knew I've had a life change in. It's an equation now that I can't get out of my head. This equation is simple. You take any life and you add the resurrection to it. I mean, you, you take a person, regardless of their life circumstances, and you add the resurrection to it, the immediate outcome is new hope. You have hope. Hope for Marriages, hope for occupations, hope for when this world ends. There's this immediate hope that comes upon you when you really believe that Jesus came back. But what, is, what happens next is not an addition. It's multiplied. Joy then starts coming on you. And joy, it, it, we've talked about it. Joy, with, There's a lot of joy stealers out there in this world. Every time something bad happens to you doesn't mean you have to give up your joy. There's joy is inside. Doesn't mean my life's always happy, but there's joy. And when joy is multiplied, believe it or not, my purpose for living is multiplied. There's a reason I'm here. Regardless of the circumstances of your birth, I don't care what the circumstances of your birth were. I don't care if after you were born, somebody wanted you or disowned you. I don't care. There's a reason you're here. God wanted you here. And when you add the resurrection and hope and joy, all of a sudden your purpose for living is multi. And then today, I saved this one for the end, I think uh, unmatched courage is multiplied in our life. If I have the resurrection, I have hope, joy, purpose, and suddenly what takes off inside the heart is courage. It was King Solomon who said in Proverbs 28, the righteous are as bold as a lion. Do you feel bold like a lion today? Or are you more like, meow? (laughs) You're like, man, things, Ron, you don't, my problem is too much bigger than you are imagining. You, You don't know how big my giant is, 
right now. And, and, and in the shadow of your giants, rather than being bold like a lion, you're like, eh, I'm not sure I can get this one. And I'm telling you, inside of you is the courage to devour your giant today. This courage. Well, courage for what? Courage in everything. There are people in here right now who have recently found the courage to love after they've been deeply wounded. They're, they're, you know what? I'm, I'm going to still love this person. They found the courage to forgive after they've been betrayed. There have been people who have found the courage to get up after a fall. I mean, they've had a serious life fall in their life, and they are now finding the courage to get back up. There are people here who are finding the courage to move forward. There's a grave in their life that wants to hold on to them, and they're finding the courage to move out of the cemetery and move forward in their life. And today, this courage is in you because Jesus Christ really did die, and he really was buried, but he really was resurrected, and in that resurrection now, it multiplies courage in you like you maybe didn't stop to comprehend. There's, there's a couple areas in my life then, so I ask myself, where do I want to be more courageous? And I think my areas are, could be your areas. Number one, courage to speak the truth in love. We live in a world right now um, where truth is being sacrificed over and over. You can't tell someone the truth. And truth in our world is being abandoned. Calling a politician a liar is a compliment now. And it, not, it used to not be that way. The prophets of old, the prophets of old, when, when, they, when they heard the word of God, they describe it as a fire that was on their tongue. Even if they wanted to hold it in, they couldn't hold it in. They had to speak the truth. And it takes a great deal of courage to speak the truth these days. You know this. Because it's not just hate the message. Now it's turning into hate the messenger. And, and if you're a guest with us today, I know this is going to be hard hitting. But I, I'm not a prophet. I'm just telling you, we all know it's coming. The day is coming when preachers will be told they can't speak, there will be a court order against preachers saying certain things in public. And I'm wondering on that day, will I have the courage to still speak the truth of God? So in a story of the apostle Peter and the apostle John, they had been arrested for preaching Jesus. There was a court order back then given you will not preach Jesus in this case. And you know what they said? They said, you know what? Are, should we listen to you or should we listen to God? That, that was their first response. And then they told him, by the way, if you let us go today, the very first thing we're going to do is go out and preach Jesus. Acts chapter 4 verse 13 says this. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized that they were just unschooled, ordinary men... They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They took notice, all right, of their boldness. They took notice, though, that they were just normal people. They were just average, normal people. But they also took notice that these men had been with Jesus. Now, okay, been with Jesus when? If they're talking about before the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, those guys ran away scared to death. Do you remember that? On the night Jesus was arrested, they took off. They weren't that bold. But after they encountered the resurrection of Jesus, they became bold speakers of truth. And, and if you and I embrace the resurrection of Jesus, we become bold proclaimers. Second Timothy chapter 1, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, that's fear, but of power and of love and of discipline. Therefore, we do... We do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Am I in this? Am I a follower of Jesus for the approval of men? Or I, am I a follower of Jesus for the approval of God? And this isn't just about a minister. This is you too. Why are you in this game? 
The righteous are as bold as lions. Number two, I need courage just to face my day-to-day battles. Moses faced Pharaoh. Elijah faced King Ahab and, uh, uh, and Queen Jezebel. Daniel faced lions. Shadrach and Ami- uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced a fiery furnace. Esther faced wicked Haman. Esther, she, and, and it's her uncle who comes to her and says, you know, for, how do you know you weren't made and put on this world for just a time like this? For just this moment, show some courage. And she does. And she saves all her people because of a moment of Courage. Ordinary people with extraordinary courage because they knew they had God on their side. Uh, Israel's backed up against a wall. There are enemies coming at them. And look what God says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position. I need you to stand firm. See the deliverance of the Lord will give you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out, face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Okay, so now this is the key. I I started seeing this phrase over and over and over again this week in my study. The Lord will be with you. The Lord will. There's something about the presence of God in our life that gives us more courage and boldness. You don't go into this alone. You're not in your battle alone. You're not standing by a grave alone. You're not going through a heartbreak alone. God is with you in this. He has not abandoned you. And there's something about knowing that the presence of God is still with me. Even if you failed, even if you messed up, he's still with me. He hasn't turned his back on me. And that gives me courage. Joshua, Joshua was about to lead the Israelites. Moses had died. Hey, Joshua, you're my new leader. Can you imagine filling those shoes? And three times God comes to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, be strong. Be courageous. Now be careful to obey all that the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn to it from the right or left so that you may be successful. God's saying, I need you to be courageous. Oh, by the way, don't bend too much on the word of God. Did you hear what I just said? You don't have to bend as far as they want you to bend on the word of God. So be courageous. He goes on in verse 9. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong. Be courageous. Don't be terrified. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. There again is this presence of God. Is it a key? It has to be a key to all of this. Speak the truth in love, courage, uh, courage to face my day-to-day battles. But the third one, I just need it myself to be reminded, and I remind you, courage in death. Ancient Romans were so intimidated by death that they separated it as far as they could from themselves. They would not, there were city laws that wouldn't allow anyone dead to be buried inside the city. So ancient Romans created what they often referred to as cities of the dead. (laughs) Graveyards, way, way out. Get them as far away from us as you can. Christians, however, came along, and they they changed all that. Christians suddenly were not afraid of death. They believed in the resurrection. They didn't fear death. It doesn't mean they had a death wish, but and it doesn't mean that some deaths aren't kind of intimidating the way people die. I get that, but, but they didn't fear dying. And it changed everything. Churches started putting cemeteries and graveyards right out the back door. They didn't move it way, way out. They brought it right next to the church, uh, the Mennonite church that I was raised in. Um, the cemetery is right out back. My sister is there, my brother is buried there, and my dad is buried there, just right outside the doors. You go to Europe, by the way, if you travel around Europe and you go to some of the great uh, cathedrals of old, ancient cathedrals, they were so unintimidated by death that they even buried some of their most loved pastors right into the floor of the church. I suggest we do that in the future. You can just kind of, Ron's still with us. Maybe not, just an idea, but 
They, were, they changed the whole, the whole way the world looks at death. That's why the psalmist, I think, said in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to be afraid. Why? Correct me if I'm wrong, but there it is again, the presence of God, for you are with me. When you and I embrace the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it gives us courage. Even in the last moments of breath, you'll have courage. Because when Jesus died and brought himself back to life, when Jesus brought life to others who were dead, he's gonna do the same for you and I. You you come back. Not everyone in this room, because of some of you are just so young. Oh my goodness. I I love that we're a five-generation church. I mean, we got the smallest of babies all the way up to the the wisest of seniors. That was a gift. And... uh, I didn't call you old, all right? And, uh, and I'm in the middle, by the way. That's where I'm going to thank you for giving me that. And, uh, and the five generations church is, is a beautiful thing. When, it, when a church becomes all just one or two generations, uh, that church is not headed for a good future. When you're five generation church, it's a strong, strong church, and we have that. And, and I love that. But sometimes I use stories from the past, and I assume that you all know the story and you don't. If I bring up the name Todd Beamer, how many of you remember the name Todd Beamer? Todd Beamer? What if I was to connect him to 9-11? How many of you remember the story of Todd Beamer from 9-11? There it goes. All right. See, a whole bunch of you in this room, you weren't even born when that happened. Some Some terrorists hijacked airplanes, flew them into buildings in New York. There was one flight coming in from Pennsylvania. Todd Beamer was a young Christian man on that flight, a young married man. And and he and others at the back of the plane were on their cell phones. They they were talking to uh, their wives. And, And Todd Beamer's wife told him what was happening in New York. They're flying planes into buildings. And he was telling her, our plane has just been hijacked. And, and it was a tense moment. And so the, the, the group in the back of the plane started talking to one another. And they're like, you know, this thing is going to go down one way or another. Maybe we ought to charge the cockpit. Maybe we ought to see if we can get the, get the plane back in our control. And so they, they came up with that plan. And Todd told his wife on the phone, we're going to go after this. And then Todd said, I want to pray with you. And he he prayed with his wife, and together they prayed Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Yeah, even if I have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not afraid, for you are with me. Your staff comforts me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And he prayed that. And then he looked at the others, and he said, are you guys ready? And they said, yeah. And he said a phrase he used all the time. He said, let's roll. That was the last thing his wife heard him say. He used it all the time. They'd be going out to dinner. He'd say, let's roll. He'd be going out back to play with his kids. He'd say, let's roll. And here to charge his enemy on an airplane, it was the last thing he said. How did he have the courage to do that? There's no fear in death. Did he want to die? No, he didn't want to die, but there's no fear. How do I have that? I want that in my life. Because I got bad news for us today. Bad news. You all are going to die. All right? Just shake your head with me. You know it, right? Some of you are like, I don't know, Ron. You know, you're you're hardcore. You're like, I I think I can do it. And you need to know, nobody has done it, all right? You're going to. And uh, so I was with Deb Gunning. She's one of our ladies here at the church. She changed my ministry forever. I've shared this before, and I've done this many times. I've shared this story uh, before somebody went into surgery. I was with her. She's about to go into surgery, and 
it was serious surgery. And, and I asked her, I said, Deb, I, I'm, I'm here to pray with you. I said, are you nervous? <laughs> she looked at me, she said, no. I was like, you're, you're not nervous? She said, no. She said, Ron, and she, she put her hand on my arm and she said, listen, she said, I'm either gonna wake up in the arms of my family or I'm gonna wake up in the arms of Jesus. She said, but either way, I'll wake up. And that, that changed my life. That's what I want. I want to be that kind of husband to my wife. I'll see you again. I want to be that kind of dad to my kids. I'll see you again. I, I'm not dying that I know of or anything. There's, this is no confession of any tumor or anything. <laughs> I, I, sh I did not write that in my notes. I don't know why my mind went there, but you all look so serious all of a sudden at me. It's like, he's going to tell us, you know, no. Uh, but if I did die, I'm trying to do it with some courage. So Moses has these 12 spies, and they're about to go into uncharted territory of the promised land. And he says, you know what, before we go, let me send these 12 spies in to spy out the land and then come out and tell us what they think. So they go in and they come out. Two spies out of the 12, only two come out and say, it's glorious. It's amazing. The land is beautiful. God is with us. Let's go. Let's roll, they said. Only two of the 12. The other 10 came out and they were so focused on the giants of their life that they forgot about the presence of God. Oh, it's too, the giants are too big. We can't win this. Some of us in this room right now are so focused on the giant that fear is starting to creep in and courage is going away. You can focus on the giant or you can focus on the presence of God. He goes with you. He's with you right now. Jesus came back from the dead. He really is alive and he's right beside you right now. He's going to help you through these battles. He's gonna help you with the truth. He's gonna help you in death. He's right there. You do live again. So what's it gonna be today for us? Are we as bold as lions? Or, yeah. 